Welcome back to the Bradford Speaker Series of CIPRI, the Center of Policy Research on Energy and the Environment. This is our first meeting of the new semester uh, and was our first in-person presenter since March of 2020. Uh, I'm Elke Weber, the Gerhard Einiger Professor of Energy and the Environment. Our speaker today is Mika Siegler, who has been a postdoctoral associate at the MIT's Institute for Data, Systems and Society, working with Jessica Transic. In his current position at MIT, Mika does precisely what we are also trying to accomplish here at Princeton, both in CIPRI and in the Anlinger Center, namely to shoot for creative synthesis of relevant science and engineering, modeling and forecasting, and policy design for better, to better ensure a sustainable energy future for our planet. Mika integrates data-based modeling and his knowledge of chemistry to evaluate sustainable energy and chemical technologies and systems. His work informs scientific research, engineering, and public policy, focusing on improving our environmental sustainability with an emphasis on mitigating climate change. Mika has a PhD in chemistry from UC Berkeley and a BS uh, in chemistry, summa cum laude, from Yale University. In graduate school, he primarily investigated dye copper complexes in order to improve our ability to use Earth's abundant first row transition metals in small molecule transformation and catalysis. After college and before graduate school, he worked for two years in the climate and energy program at the World Resource Institute. There he explored how to improve mutual trust and confidence among parties developing international climate change policy and researched carbon dioxide capture and storage, electricity transmission and international energy technology policy. Prior to that, Mika spent a year as a loose scholar assigned to the Business Environmental Council in Hong Kong where he helped advise businesses on measuring and managing their environmental sustainability. At MIT, Mika currently focuses on energy storage. He examines how energy storage technologies and have changed over time in order to determine how to accelerate their improvements. He also studies how energy storage can be used to integrate intermittent renewable resources into a broader energy system. He will tell us today about this work. The title of his talk is on the screen that you see. If you have questions uh, in, in the uh, online audience, uh, please uh, put them into the Q&A uh, and Chuck will moderate uh, your, your requests. We also have about 10 people in the audience here who will just afterwards just raise their hand. So without further ado, Mika, over to you. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. As you heard, my name is Micah Ziegler. I am a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute for Data Systems and Society at MIT. Uh, I was flattered when I saw the digital poster for this talk. It said I was an assistant professor. That, that is very optimistic. Uh, not yet. I will be applying for assistant professorships this fall. Uh, today, I want to discuss enabling rapid technological change. And I'm going to focus on the technologies we hope will help us mitigate climate change. And I'll be particularly describing energy storage technologies. And I'll be relying on quantitative insights from three decades of improvement of lithium ion battery technologies. So over the course of this talk, I want to go through a few subjects. The first is I want to introduce you to why we study technological change, what our goals are, what our motivations are. Then I want to give you a brief introduction to the context that kind of guided some of the research you'll hear about today. This came from an understanding of what we might need from energy storage technologies in the context in which they'll have to operate. Then I want to go into detail describing how we can enable technological improvement by studying both how and why technologies improve. And then finally, I would like to leave you with a few conclusions and maybe some implications for public policy making and financial investments. So to start, why do we study technological change? I consider the study of technological change one step in a broader, pragmatic, data-informed approach to achieving at least some environmental goals. I've outlined the approach here. The research I conduct kind of com includes the first three steps of this approach, and we'll walk through it. But before we do, I, the premise of this approach is that we have limited time and limited resources to achieve our environmental goals. And I wanna see if we can be more intelligent in how we spend that time and spend those resources to help us avoid even worse impacts of climate change. This is a general approach that I, is really just one way in which research can have an impact on environmental goals. 
and the research steps that I'll describe are conducted by myself as well as many others. So to begin, it starts with understanding how technologies will need to operate in context. This is trying to figure out what we will need from technologies to achieve our energy, our environmental, our economic, and our social goals, and how the requirements of those technologies might change over time and over space. For example, we already know that different communities and countries will need different portfolios of technologies to essentially allow them to meet their combined energy and environmental goals. Can you want to switch to your slide screen as a primary screen? Because right now people are viewing you talking as opposed to the third. They can, yeah. Well, why don't you switch to the slides? Thank you. Okay. So then we'll keep it on the slides for now. That, that is might, where most of the I data. You may, may have to do it though from your end because you're sharing your screen. Okay. We'll hear you, but we really want to see that PowerPoint a little bit bigger. Okay. So it's not currently showing any of the slides. Can you select select like this off PowerPoint? Okay. The other thing that people can do is this. Um, they can actually enlarge this small screen. But they, they can't see this as the primary right now? No, that's not showing. You're showing as the primary. Okay. What happens if I stop the video? Or if you stop the video, you can start it again. Oh. I would prefer people to see the slides. Yeah. Well, the other thing people can do, if you can't figure this out quickly, the other thing people can do, if, you, if they just literally just increase the size of the window, it's a teeny window, it can be made as big as they want by just dragging the edges of it. And we can't just it. make it the primary window? You should be able to. I, I don't think I can, I can do it from my window. Let me see. Well, we got a we got a lot we got a lot of things going here. Okay, let's try sharing it again. On your desktop, it should show. There we go. There we go. Great. Now you reversed it, so that's fine. Okay, but people can see the slide because that's where the, the data. Slide are. is primary, and, and you're in a smaller window. Great. They don't need to see me. The slides are where the data are. I am not a bar plot, but you will see those in this presentation. So this is the pragmatic data informed approach to achieving at least some environmental goals. And we'll go through it. So for those of you who haven't seen this slide yet, uh, we'll be going through it and it'll come up again over and over in the talk. So we start with trying to understand what we'll need from technologies in context what they'll, we will require them to reach our energy, environmental, economic, and social goals, and how those requirements might change over time and space, how different countries might need different portfolios of technologies. So in this research, we use models and simulations to try to study these technologies and the context in which they'll operate, and our results are used to set performance targets and identify challenges and opportunities for those technologies. Given that understanding, we can then identify promising features of technology that could help us meet targets. So I should mention here that when I discuss technologies, I'm using a very broad definition. They include hardware like lithium ion batteries or solar photovoltaic modules. It also includes entire systems like the electricity grid. It can also include non-tangible technologies, an algorithm that helps an energy storage system operate more efficiently or even instructions for more rapidly building a nuclear power plant. These are all what I consider different technologies. And when I say we're identifying promising features of technologies, typically it's not always prudent to try to pick and choose technologies from a policy perspective. There can be a lot of uncertainty as to how technologies might change, how their costs might change over time, how their 
performance might change, whether or not we can reach those targets with individual technologies. So often you want to identify features of technologies, like a technology having zero or very few carbon dioxide emissions could be a feature of a technology or something that can be scaled very quickly. That can be a feature of a technology. So given the understanding and the identification of some features of technologies, we can then set out to investigate <laughs> strategies to improve and deploy technologies. So this is where we ask questions like, let's say we know we need to bring the cost of a technology down. What can we do to help us do that most effectively, given our limited time and our limited resources? Do we need to invest in research and development? If so, which avenues of research and development might be most productive? Or do we just need to scale up manufacturing? Do we need bigger plants and that will just help us get to where we want to go? Here we're asking those questions and trying to figure out what we can do to help the technologies we have reach the goals we set us. Then people actually have to go and do all these things, the people who conduct research and development, who craft public policy, who direct financial investments, they make a bunch of decisions. And we're hoping to inform their decision-making using the research I just described in the past three steps. So that way they can be more effective. For example, if you go on to craft public policies, we're hoping that this research can help your decisions be more effective at improving technologies to help them reach their goals. Finally, the technologies change, objectives might change, what we want from them might change. And then ideally the world changes for the better. And then we go back to the beginning where we given those new technologies and maybe new objectives, we want to understand whether or not we're still on the right track. We want to always be reevaluating so we can best inform this process. So as I mentioned, my research covers the first three steps of this cycle. And most of what we're going to talk about today involves this third step, because I firmly believe that understanding how and why technologies change can inform strategies to enable or even accelerate their improvement. But before we get into that, I want to take a step backward and describe a little bit of the context that guided this work. So we're going to kind of briefly over go through the first two steps in two slides. So what do we need from energy storage technologies, for example? Do we need them to be really energy efficient? Do we need them to be very low cost? Do we need them to be able to respond rapidly? Well, two primary uses of energy storage technologies in terms of mitigating climate change include uh, electrifying transportation and then also integrating renewables into a broader grid. So for electrifying transportation, a popular option is battery electric vehicles. And uh, many cost targets for battery electric vehicles rely primarily on the price of the battery pack. Essentially, the price of that battery pack or the cost of manufacturing it uh, depending on whether you make it or purchase it, uh, divided by the energy capacity of that battery pack. So it's the cost per energy capacity. This isn't the only important metric, but it's a very important metric when looking at uh, battery electric vehicles. We also find that the same metric really matters for integrating renewables like solar and wind into a broader grid, that the overall cost of that is, can be very sensitive to energy capacity costs. Again, the cost of energy storage divided by the capacity of energy storage. Uh, this was actually a major conclusion of some work that I and a few others published back in 2019. And it's been supported by different studies that used a variety of methods and data, uh, including some great work that Professor Jenkins published earlier this year with a few collaborators. We really find that energy capacity costs matter a lot for integrating solar and wind into a broader grid. So we want to focus at least on, in this talk on the cost of energy capacity. So now I want to pick a technology. Now I'm not picking a technology for the future. I'm not saying this is what we should support with all of our research funding. I'm just picking a technology to study, to learn how energy capacity costs can change or have changed and might change. Uh, and there are many different options. You can pump water uphill and let it come down when you need the energy back. You can compress air underground. You can store energy in batteries. You could store it in fuels, you could store it in flywheels, you can even stack concrete bricks, which has received some attention recently. You can move heavy trains up and down hills. Because batteries are being used in both electric vehicles and increasingly being used in stationary applications, I want to focus on electrochemical storage, see how those costs have come down. And now we get into investigating technological improvement. How did battery costs come down? And 
how can we you know, maybe possibly do something similar going forward? So this is coming to that third step of that pragmatic data informed approach. And so I specifically wanted to focus on lithium ion batteries. Why? Because we think they've improved rapidly. They might be a good model to study. I'm showing a visual progression of that improvement on the top of this slide. Uh, on the upper left, you have an early cell that shuttled lithium ions back and forth to store energy from the early 1980s. In the middle, you have some of the first commercially available cells produced by Sony. And in the upper right, you have a stationary facility, again, using lithium ion technologies to help support an electric grid. So they appear to be improving quickly, but we want to know how quickly. Is it actually a good model? Then we want to figure out what led to that improvement and what lessons can we learn from that? And then how can we enable further improvement for other energy storage technologies? What can researchers, policymakers, and business leaders do to help their energy storage technologies come down in cost? So to answer these questions, I set out to take a pretty similar approach, and you'll see this throughout. First, I take a comprehensive look at all of the data that I can get my hands on. Then I rigorously analyze these data, and then I distill robust insights that can hopefully improve decision making. So to start, we wanted to look at all the data we have on the improvement of lithium ion batteries. And I'm presenting some of those, some of that data here. Uh, we got price series that people had used to investigate the cost decline of lithium ion battery technologies. We're using price as a proxy for cost because cost data are few and far between. And we found a lot of uncertainty in the data that researchers had used. Uh, you'll notice maybe that the y-axis here, which is price in dollars per kilowatt hour, is a logarithmic axis. So small differences on this are actually represent a large difference on linear space. And you can measure the rates of improvement of these technologies over time, which is our x-axis here. You can actually kind of estimate the improvement every year, the percentage decrease in price, which I'll call the annual decrease ratio. And those range from 9% up to 29%, all for lithium ion batteries. And this is an impactful difference. If you try to just project these trends forward, I'm not saying that this is what's gonna happen, but if you just did, you can see that there are these decade long windows for when technologies might cross a certain threshold. There's a lot of uncertainty there. So we wanted to see what's going on and can we come up with a better estimate? We set out to do that. Uh, and we found that cell prices decreased by 97% between 1991 and 2018. We did this by collecting all the data those researchers had used and other data. We went back to primary sources. We harmonized data series and data points and we categorized the data. So lithium ion cells come in different shapes. There are cylindrical cells, there are prismatic cells and there are pouch cells. And these shapes tend to have different prices. Cylindrical cells tend to be less expensive. Most of the data we found described either cylindrical cells or they tried to describe all types of lithium ion cells. So within each category, we got the best data that we could and we developed these representative series, which I've plotted here as these bold dashed lines, orange for all types of cells and blue just for cylindrical cells. And that color coding is going to apply across the next couple slides. Um, and these we see that there's a considerable difference in the price trajectory for cylindrical cells and all types of cells. And these types of estimates of price decline can be used in top-down studies of cost change. We can use it to kind of examine how technologies have changed over time. So what do I mean by a top-down study? So there are kind of two sets of methods I'll be describing and using in the work that I'll be presenting in this talk. But uh, on the, there are these top down methods, which I just referenced, and they're phenomenological models. They require high level data on technological progress and drivers. So a measure of technological progress could be the price per kilowatt hour. And a driver could be something like time. We don't actually think that if you put a lithium ion battery cell into a closet and let it age, that it's going to get better. We're using time as a proxy for a number of different processes. It's not like aging wine. But time is a driver that some people use. Uh, other drivers are cumulative production. When you look at the change in uh, technology versus cumulative production, we colloquially refer to this as Wright's law. Uh, when we look at it versus time, we refer to that as Moore's law. Uh, you can look at annual production. You can look at cumulative research and development activity. And 
these models allow you to basically infer the importance of a driver based on the strength of the correlation. And they also allow you to estimate the rates of improvement. So a common improvement rate you might have heard of is called the learning rate. This is the observed declining cost of a technology upon a doubling of the cumulative production of that technology. And this is the rate that you estimate when you use Wright's law. So these are the top down models. You also have bottom up models uh, that are what I will call mechanistic models. They require a cost equation and a lot of data on the design, engineering, manufacturing, raw materials, and all the things that go into a technology. And these models allow you to estimate given components contributions to cost decline. And we'll come back to them and we'll start with phenomenological models. So we have our price data, our price per kilowatt hour, which we're using as a proxy for cost. So we have the left side of this equation, the measure of technological progress. Well, we need data for the right side of the equation. We need driver data. And so we go out to collect as much data as we can on for example, the size of the market for lithium ion technologies. Uh, I'm showing some of that data here. We find that market size increased by four orders of magnitude over 27 years. Uh, we similarly harmonized the data and we split it into different subgroups based on whether they referred to cylindrical cells or prismatic cells or all types of cells. And with that in hand, we have the price per kilowatt hour data. We have the market size data. We also collected patent data and then time we didn't actually have to collect any data on. And then we can fit those models of technological change. And I'm showing the results of that analysis here where we're looking at price decline versus time on the left, cumulative production in the center, and then cumulative patent filings on the right. Um, in the first two of these analyses, we could split the analysis and just look at cylindrical cells only or all types of cells. Um, and on the far right, we have a cumulative patents, which we couldn't really easily split into those that were specific to cylindrical cells. And you can see, for example, that over time, both all types of cells and cylindrical cells fell at about 13% per year, uh, whereas versus, sorry, cumulative production, uh, we actually see a difference in the learning rate, for example. Uh, all types of cells have a learning rate of 20%. And Cylindrical cells had a learning rate of 24%, which is a pretty big difference uh, because the, it might not seem initially that big because it's just 4%, but this number is in the exponent of a power law. It's a actually really big difference in terms of how we measure the improvement of a technology. But honestly, when I did this analysis, it kind of felt wanting. It felt as though I wasn't looking at the whole picture because Lithium ion batteries weren't adopted because they were the least expensive technology available at a given time. They were adopted because they allowed you to hold a camcorder in the palm of your hand. We had lead acid batteries, we had nickel metal hydride batteries. Really, lithium ion batteries were important because they had a high energy density. You could put a lot of energy into a small volume. And so I wanted to see, you know, could we also examine that improvement? Because I felt like it was missing from this. And so we went ahead and did that, and we wanted. We started by looking at the progress, the measure of technological progress on the left side of this equation. And what are we basically saying when we use price per kilowatt hour here? We're saying that we're looking at the cost or price of a technology scaled by the service that technology provides. And when we look at dollars per kilowatt hour, we're saying that the service is just the energy capacity that the cell stores. Uh, and this seemed kind of limited. So could we set out to consider other attributes of a lithium ion cell? So we decided to use a multiplicative model, which here we're gonna say that the service provided by a lithium ion cell is the product of different cell level attributes. It's a model that's really as simple or as parsimonious as possible while still capturing the effects we're interested in. And we're gonna say, for example, that the service per cell can be you know, estimated by the product of the energy capacity per cell and the energy density of the cell. Uh, we do a little bit of algebra. We essentially take price of a cell and divide it by that definition of service. Um, and we're going to assume that they're equally weighted attributes, that they're equally important. And then we get down to a definition of price per service at the bottom of this slide, where we could estimate it using data on the price per energy capacity, which we have. I've already shown you that data. That's the dollars per kilowatt hour series. 
And then if we could also get data on volume per energy capacity, we could estimate the price per surface. And volume per energy capacity is just the inverse of energy density. So I returned to that approach of collect as much data as possible and then analyze it. We collected a lot of data on how energy density changed over time. In this case, we had a lot of data on commercial, commercially available lithium ion cells. We found that there was a dramatic increase in energy density between 1991 and the early 2010, and a little bit of leveling off since then. Uh, we also found there was an increasing spread in energy density. Uh, this is in part because not every application of lithium ion technologies necessarily needed the most energy dense cell available at a given time. You could get away with something, you know, maybe less energy dense than was available if you're using it for a certain application. Uh, so to deal with that spread we and still get these representative series to track the progress of the technology, we used 98th percentile and we have data for all types of cells and just cylindrical cells, which are again represented by bold dashed lines at the top of this envelope. And then we can set out, we can estimate price per service and we can apply fit those same phenomenological models. Uh, looking at Moore's law, Wright's law, and the cumulative patent analysis, for which we don't have a colloquial term. And I'm showing here in orange the data for all types of cells when service is limited to energy capacity. And in purple, I'm showing the data for all types of cells when service is energy capacity and energy density, when we've expanded that definition. And we see in all three cases, the improvement rate is considerably higher because we're considering another you know, component of the improvement of lithium ion technologies. So what does any of this mean? You know, can we actually say lithium ion technologies have improved rapidly? So the question there is kind of compared to what? Well, we can compare it to other technologies, which I'm doing here. Um, so on the left, I'm showing the improvement rates you measure versus time, the annual decrease ratios. And on the right, I'm showing the improvement rates versus cumulative production, which are the learning rates. And on the top, I'm showing estimates that we would get if we use other people's data series, other people's price and market size data series. And those are in gray and orange, these floating histograms. And on the bottom, I'm showing the improvement rates measured for other technologies and the chemical, hardware, and energy sectors. And you can see already, this is all just improvement rates when we consider the service to just the energy capacity. And our estimates are provided by these uh, vertical dashed lines. Already, just when we consider the limited definition of service, the improvement with time, the annual decrease ratio, is already quite high compared to other technologies for lithium ion. The learning rate is towards the high end of energy technologies and kind of towards the middle bottom of chemical technologies. And then we can expand the definition of service, measure the improvement rate as price per service improves and we're including energy density in the definition of service. And we see you know, our result, our estimates move to the right, they get higher. And we see that really there was considerable improvement over time for lithium ion batteries. And now the learning rates are towards the top end of energy technologies and kind of towards the middle top of chemical technologies. So this gives us a sense of how the technologies improve. And they also have a bit of an implication for the future, which is, but this is possibly a, a way to kind of get a sense as to how much the improvement in cost of lithium ion technologies might have been limited by an additional focus on improving energy density. So our results suggest that potentially for stationary applications where energy density and doesn't matter, you might see faster improvement for lithium ion technologies. But this is again, you know, this is an implication, and we've got a measure of how the technology changed. We also want to know why the technology changed. And that's where we use these mechanistic models. So I'll go into a little bit more detail on them. It's a pretty new approach to studying the change in cost of a technology or the change in performance of a technology. Um, it's a dynamic bottom up approach, dynamic in the sense that it considers how technologies change over time, and bottom up because it requires details about how the technology is constructed. I'm showing on the top right of this slide the cost equation for solar photovoltaic modules, which was the first that essentially technology to which this methodological approach was applied. And here, the cost of a module, where you have the cost of it in dollars divided by the power of the module in watts, 
it is defined as a function of variables that of things that contributed to the cost. For example, the price of silicon for a silicon photovoltaic module, the price of silicon matters, it's one of the variables. The efficiency of the module, the size of the plant, these all matter. And so, you know, we developed the cost equation that gave us the cost in dollars per watt, or a few colleagues of mine developed it and published that work in 2018. The cost is a function of variables that, and the detail that you put in reflects the importance of those variables and then data availability. We don't have unlimited data on how technology has changed over time. But then you can derive cost change equations. And these allow you to estimate the given variable's contribution to cost change. But because we don't have unlimited data, we can't monitor how costs changed in continuous time or how these variables changed. We require a few approximations because we're dealing with discrete time points. We kind of compare technology at time one and technology at time two. But when you do that and you derive these cost change equations, it allows you to disentangle the impacts of multiple simultaneous changes to a technology when those changes are non-additive. Uh, by using a cost equation or a cost model, like the one I'm showing in the upper right, it lowers your chance of double counting an effect because you've clearly defined cost. And these uh, models can be used both retrospectively, which I'll be discussing a retrospective study, study today, but they can also be used prospectively to get a sense as to how a, you know, technology might change given various, you know, expected changes to the components of the technology, um, also given different physical limits. So uh, I want to briefly, you know, take a slight pause from the progression of the talk today to do two things. One, I want to just mention that the research we're about to discuss is not yet published. It's been accepted for publication, but it's not quite ready for broader distribution. So if you want to discuss it publicly, I would just appreciate it if you held off for a month or two before the, when it appears in press. Uh, and the other thing is I want to make sure we're all kind of on the same page as to what goes into a lithium ion cell. Um, those top down models didn't really require knowledge of what goes into a lithium ion cell, but the bottom up models do. So I'm showing a very simplified diagram of an electrochemical cell, a sealed electrochemical cell here on this slide. Um, one side on the left here, I'm showing you the cathode. In lithium ion technologies, this is typically a metal oxide, like lithium cobalt oxide, where cobalt is your metal. Um, oh, the oxide is oxygen, of course. And then it's a lithium ion cell, so you have lithium. Um, cobalt's not the only metal we can use. You can actually use different combinations of nickel, manganese, and cobalt, or nickel, cobalt, and aluminum. There are a variety of metals you can use. On the other side, you have an anode. Anodes are typically made out of carbon, often graphite. And when you charge a lithium ion cell, essentially the lithium ions migrate from the cathode to the anode. So graphite is sheets of carbon and the lithium ions actually kind of sit between the sheets. And when you discharge it, they migrate back. But they can't just jump through a vacuum. They need some help getting from the cathode to the anode. That's where the electrolyte comes in. It's typically a lithium salt, like lithium hexafluoric phosphate dissolved in an organic solvent. On either side, you get these current collectors, which are typically aluminum foil or copper foil. And then you have a separator, because if your cathode and anode came together, that would be a short circuit. And so you have a separator to keep them apart that's typically made out of plastic, like polyethylene or polypropylene. So given this knowledge and much more knowledge about how lithium ion cells are produced, you we can develop a cost equation for lithium ion cells, which I'm showing you here. Uh, there's a section for the cathode, the anode, the electrolyte, the foils, other hardware, and plant size dependent costs. Uh, and this cost change equation, this cost change model works for any lithium ion cell, but we narrowed our focus. Remember earlier when I showed you that envelope of energy density, there were many different options. Well, when we we wanted to make sure that we weren't looking at changes that were implemented to help lithium ion batteries perform other tasks, for example, work in a power tool. We wanted to really just look at cost change and cost per energy capacity. So we limited our analysis to energy dense 18650 size cells. Uh, 18650 just describes the size of the cylinder for a common type of cylindrical cell. And changes in these individual variables we're going to refer to those as low level mechanisms of cost change, because those are the mechanisms through which the cost of the cell change. 
through changes in the different components and their features and their prices. So I mentioned that kind of common approach. This is just a model. This is just a series of equations. We need data. So we undertook a massive data collection effort. Uh, we collected data from academic articles, corporate reports, legal filings, specification sheets, industry studies. We have over a thousand records, 15,000 qualitative and quantitative data points and 280 references. And those are only the references in which we found data that were applicable to the study. And I'm showing you just the data that we collected for one of the 41 variables in that cost equation, the price of the cathode material for the most part. Um, and you'll see that it went down over time. You'll also might see that I've highlighted two regions, one in orange, one in red, and they're the late 1990s and early 2010s. Remember how I mentioned we don't have unlimited data. We kind of need to compare cost change between two snapshots in time. Well, we're going to use the late 1990s, that first region, and the early 2010s as the second region. And within each, I have these horizontal lines. They represent these the best estimate we have for that variable during that period, during that time period. And I have these dotted lines above and below them. They represent our estimates of the uncertainty on our that representative variable, the representative value for the variable. So we can put this data into our cost equation, and then we can estimate the contributions of low-level mechanisms of cost change. And the contribution, the percent contribution of different low level mechanisms, and I've aggregated some of them here, uh, are represented by the length of these orange bars. So now we can qual quantitatively estimate what different changes contributed to the cost decline of lithium ion technologies. We find the biggest cost contributor was the, decrease, the increase in cell charge density. So the ability to hold more charge in a given volume of material, the creation of thinner separators so you could put more active material in there. All of these things contributed to cell charge density increasing between the late 1990s and early 2010s. And all of those changes contributed to 38% of the cost reduction. The second most important contributor was the decrease in price of cathode material. And then the, that contributed 18%. And then the third most was plant size and plant size related effects that contributed 14%. So when people start talking about what actually enabled a technology to change, here we can start to quantitatively evaluate some of those statements to see what really did lead to cost decline in this technology. And you can see that while I mentioned the top three contributors, we have contributions from across the board for the most part, nano materials, separator materials, they all improved, their prices came down, our ability to utilize the capacity that's actually in the cell, that went up. So there were contributions all over the place. And when I talk to students, I say, if you just see bars, uh, you should try to wonder, are there, is there uncertainty behind their bars? That's an important thing when teaching, but that uncertainty is something we need to try to at least estimate. Um, and we did do an uncertainty analysis, and I'm showing the results of that here as whiskers on those bars. And we see that for the most part, our results are pretty robust to the uncertainty in the data that we have. So here we're using those dashed lines on our estimates of the uncertainty on the representative values to kind of get a sense as to, you know, is our ranking robust? And cell charge density really still wins the day throughout cathode material prices, almost always the second. And there's more uncertainty in the contribution of plant size and related effects. But we can also take this a step further. Here we were looking at low level mechanisms. The name itself should give you a hint that there might be other mechanisms, let's say high level mechanisms. And these are the mechanisms that someone might think about when deciding to craft a public policy or a financial investment. Um, and we can take the different country, the different variables and assign them to high level mechanisms like research and development or learning by doing or economies of scale. We also have an other category because some things we just honestly can't assign in a rigorous fashion. Um, so we go through and assign them all, and some of them have to be split between a few. And then we can sum up the contributions of these high-level mechanisms, which are the drivers of those low-level mechanisms. And we can estimate their contribution to cost decline over time. We find that research and development was the primary contributor to cost reduction uh, between the late 1990s and early 2010s. 
54% of the cost reduction, give or take, can be assigned to research and development. Economies of scale were secondary, they contributed about 30%. And again, I'm showing you just bars here, so you should be wondering what's the uncertainty of any of this. We did do an uncertainty analysis and found that our ranking was pretty robust to different plausible assignments. And then we could take it even one step further. Where did this research and development come from? Did it come from physics? Did it come from ecology? We actually you know, were able to dis disaggregate that contribution and find that really the vast majority of that research and development contribution came from advancements in chemistry and material science defined broadly. You know? uh, and we found, you know, when looking through all the equations and the data, we find that really there were many different changes that happened all at the same time that all had significant contributions to cost decline. And part of this is because some people were working on making cathodes better. Some people were working on making anodes to get better. And they could put them together and get different combinations. There were many combinations that were available in the essentially design that is a lithium ion. Cell. So what does any of this mean? I said I would hopefully leave you with a few conclusions, but here we are. Uh, the first is from that top-down analysis, and it's that lithium ion batteries might achieve faster cost declines for stationary applications. So what's an implication of that conclusion? Well, interpretations that are based on measures of past improvement might benefit from considering other non-cost characteristics, especially when those characteristics are really important to a technology. Another conclusion is that even after commercialization, cost reduction can be dominated by public and private research and development, even while economies of scale remain secondary. So my analysis was from the late 1990s to the early 2010s years after the commercial introduction of the technology, which was 1991 for lithium ion technologies. And we have limited data. We haven't applied this approach to tens and tens of technologies. We've applied it to a few, but we are starting to see that, you know, research and development can still be very important after commercial introduction. So an implication of that, if you're designing a policy, let's say, maintain funding for public and private R&D, even after commercial introduction of a technology. There could still be a lot to gain. And then finally, we propose that access to a diverse chemical space might have enabled batteries to improve rapidly. I mentioned that for the cathode, you could use many different metals. Anodes could be improved separately. You could combine all of these. And so you, know, you one could even possibly consider lithium ion technologies a modular design that requires more research to really verify. But the fact that you could drop in all these different things and combine them to create different types of lithium ion cells, that might have helped in them improve rapidly. So for people directing investments, they should, if you, we wanna see something like this occur again, maybe they should encourage the exploration of diverse chemistries and materials that can be combined in a modular design. And this especially might be useful to avoid lock-in. Some people are worried that lithium ion technologies will advance so quickly uh, that they'll just outcompete other things, that other technologies won't be able to gain a foothold in the market because lithium ion technologies will be so inexpensive, even though those other technologies might be better in the long run. We don't know. But if you create policies that can encourage the exploration of a diversity of chemical options, you might reduce the chance of lock in by essentially encouraging people to continue looking beyond what is simply the lowest cost of it. There are many people I should thank for helping with this research, notably my advisor at MIT, Professor Jessica Transit, a few collaborators with whom I study cost and cost change, Joe Song, Gokshin Kovlak, and James McNerney. The entirety of the current Transit Lab is listed here. We have a pre-pandemic photo, and I have to thank the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the MIT Portugal Program, and the MIT Office of Sustainability for funding this work. So, I would like to thank you for listening and answer any questions you might have. Oh, that shows up there. Hi, Let me start with questions from the room and then I'll, I'll, I'll look down the questions from the Q&A that people are sending in. Okay. Read those to you. Sure. So you mentioned the use of these sorts of mechanistic or bottom up models for um, for living analysis. <clears throat> Could you elaborate a bit on how, like, given the work you've done now with lithium ion unpacking, 
historical trends, you might turn those same tools to look at uh, perspective trends for either automotive or stationary applications. Okay. You know, guidance for researcher technology policy. I don't want to go too far into providing guidance because it's actually an area of active research in our laboratory. We're trying to see what we can learn from applying these models prospectively to lithium-ion technologies. Yeah, more how would you do it rather than what they're talking about? Okay, yes. Yeah. So I mean, you could essentially start kind of changing the cost equation slightly to reflect uh, changes to the technology, which you can essentially zero out some components and add some components that go from zero to something else. And it allows you to kind of get a sense as to which changes are really impactful overall. And again, you know, there are many different ways to model the cost of a lithium ion technology. There's a really popular model out there named Backpack. Uh, you know, you can do this type of analysis there as well, but what really we can do is disentangle non-additive contributions very clearly um, and also then assign them to different drivers. So if we really think like, you know, a certain tech, a certain component or a certain characteristic becomes really important in the modeling when we look at various different things, you know, or do a sensitivity analysis and vary the variables. Uh, we can really, you know, see, kind of start narrowing down what types of research should get funding if we think that they're the most, you know, promising for that variable to change over time. Maybe as a follow up, what, what else do you need to know? You don't you don't get from the retrospective analysis um, to constrain the possibilities for future changes in the underlying parameters that well, you're using in that for looking Yeah, there are of course physical limits. For example, Th those don't. Sometimes they come up in the historical analysis. Sometimes they don't. Uh, you know, sometimes the historical analysis has already hit a physical limit. Uh, but an important component there is like the physical limits of different materials, and then the capability to create replacement materials. Um, you know, prices might change, right? The price of a raw material might change and getting a sense as to whether there are any limits would also be an important characteristic. And then you know, I've also mentioned the size of the plant matters, you know, what is physically realistic? You know, engineers have a sense of how big something can actually be or how fast it can be run. Um, yeah, I can sure. have a quick question. It's, it's maybe a stupid question. So there are none. Do you have any idea of the differences of um, cost of decline rates among various uh, battery storage durations? For example, do you think the uh, cost of decline rate of a uh, ten-hour battery storage will be higher than a one-hour battery storage in the next twenty years? Because like currently, the cost of like ten our battery storage is much, much higher than 12 So naturally, a 10-hour storage system will be higher because it has higher energy capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, we really just focused on looking at how the energy capacity cost would change over time, which should influence that variable, essentially, the cost of energy capacity. Uh, we try to focus on using scaled metrics, right? So that kind of hopefully gets at the idea of how much it costs to add an extra hour essentially, right? Or, you know, add some energy capacity uh, rather than comparing just a four hour or 10 hour system is yes, currently a 10 hour system is going to be more expensive because it can hold more energy. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question. Um, but I'm happy to, you know, discuss in more detail afterwards as well. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so we, we have two questions uh, from the Q&A, maybe up to three. The first is from Eric Lars, and I'll re I can read it to you. Sure, that would be great, because I can't see them. Okay, he says, I'm surprised that learning by doing does not contribute more significantly to high-level mechanisms. Would you expect a similar mix of contributions for a technology like solar PV modules that are further along in commercial introduction? That's a great question. And this one I can answer confidently because the research has been done. Uh, learning by doing had a pretty limited effect. Uh, I can actually uh, send you the, main, the paper that was published um, on how this, uh, basically applying this approach to uh, to solar photovoltaic modules. 
Now that paper was focused on production of the module itself, but not on its installation. Um, but part of why we have a small definition of learning by doing, or part of why we have a small contribution of learning by doing might result in part from the definition that we're using. So if you're gonna build, let's say an experimental line to produce something, we consider that research and development. Basically anything short of commercial scale production, we attribute to research and development. Like if, you can, if you're doing an experiment or making a prototype, because that we group that into research and development, that might kind of, that, that definition might result in kind of lower than expected contributions of learning by doing based on people who in their head have a more expansive definition of learning by doing. And we're not necessarily saying one definition is right and the other definition is wrong. We're simply, we tried to clearly delineate the definition we used in the manuscript um, and then went with that definition. You would expect if you looked at the installation side of things, a larger role for learning by doing too. I, I, based on our intuition, historically, we believe, you know, there's learning by doing when humans are involved. Right. Um, yes, I, I would expect that, but I do not study the installation of solar photovoltaics in that much detail. I think Ruth is raising her hand and I feel like she's been- You know, Ruth, if she would put it, tell her to write it into the Q&A, whatever. She's, she's not showing up here. Ruth, it might be better if you have a question to put it in the Q&A is what I'm being told. I hope that there hasn't been a mistake with my talk through the entire time. That would be unfortunate. Well, I think we can see, I can see her hand, but if, if we, I don't think we should let her talk at this point, I think she should write it. She's welcome to talk. I, I trust Ruth, I know her. All right, let me see if you know her, let's see what we can do. In the meantime, I'm happy to take another one of the written questions. All right. <clears throat> this is from um, Stanislav Jarosek. Can you comment on cost change analysis at the cell level versus the whole automotive pack level where you need to consider thermal management systems? I, I could, but I'll refrain from doing so because we haven't analyzed that in detail. That's a great question. Um, and we did focus on the cell level, which is just one more limitation of our study. Uh, partly, you kind of want to, you know how I mentioned two snapshots in time? You want those to be separated enough that you're not kind of trying to read too much into data that were collected at too similar of a time. Um, and so we wanted to focus on the cell level because we could really get that two decade, give or take difference between the late 1990s and early 2010s. Uh, to really get a sense as to what's going on at the pack level when thermal management is very important, that would require a new analysis. Okay, why don't we try to allow Ruth to talk? Ruth, I think you have the floor. I, I think that's an error, sorry. Oh, not a problem. Great to hear your voice. Yep, we hear you. I'm actually listening from Paris, so there's no way I'm going to contribute. Well, thank you for thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. Um, do we have other questions? If that turns out if that was just an error. Okay. Yes, we do. Um, <clears throat> this is from Anonymous. You mentioned that there may be an issue of lock-in for lithium-ion batteries due to rapidly declining costs. Yes. Thinking about grid storage applications. What are your thoughts on allocating resources to efforts in modifying lithium ion battery designs to take advantage of economies of scale versus exploring other kinds of battery designs? Should the former be emphasized more than the latter? Okay, so I believe the question is saying should we consider uh, making essentially lithium ion adjacent technologies which can benefit from the learning and the economies of scale that will continue through further use of lithium ion batteries often in the battery electric vehicle industry. Um, that's a great idea. I wish I were the first person to come up with it. Uh, no, this, this is actually something that was discussed by uh, a few researchers, uh, 
six or eight months ago in an article in Jewel, where they actually looked at lock-in and how lithium ion batteries might just really take over so many different storage applications. Uh, I think it is, you know, a, a reasonable con conclusion or really a reasonable implication from the results that we've seen so far. But I, you know, I would be hesitant to say that we should really focus our efforts on lithium ion adjacent technologies because there's this whole world of chemistry out there. You could take almost any two elements on the periodic table and make some type of electrochemical cell. That's a bit of an exaggeration, but there are so many different options out there. You know, the, the sheer number of options increases the chance that any one option is not the optimal choice. Uh, so I would be hesitant to say, you know, to really just put research and development all into, you know, lithium ion adjacent technologies. But I, I don't think that's a bad idea. I think that's a reasonable, you know, implication based on the results. But uh, I would encourage you, if, if Anonymous wants to email me, I'm happy to email them that paper, uh, which was done by a a researchers with whom I collaborated, but I, I did not write it. But it is a reasonable option to pursue. Um, okay, we still we have two two final questions. It looks like um, <clears throat> the first is from Henry, uh, like ben, Benke. Uh, is there a safety cost component? He asks. We grouped safety into the other hardware costs. Uh, we didn't have a ton of data on it. Like I said, there are limitations. I I wish that I could go back in time and sit in a Sony manufacturing plant and collect all the data from the mid nineties with a stopwatch to see how fast things went. We can't. Um, so we kind of grouped the cost of safety components into this other hardware cost, which is in the cost equation, we included that. Uh, but I will say we don't have a ton of visibility into that because those data just weren't publicly available in the resources we found. As I mentioned, we, we did conduct an exhaust, you know, pretty exhaustive search. We collected over 15,000 qualitative and quantitative data points, but there could be other data out there. And hopefully people can take the model that we developed and will be in press, or, or, sorry, published soon, in print soon. And if they have additional data, you know, help refine these results. That I don't think any one of these analyses should be the final word on something. We're constantly getting new data and technologies are changing. So we need multiple approaches and multiple methods to try to answer the same questions so we can you know, come up with more robust conclusions and multiple data sources. I should have added that. Okay, we have one final question. Uh, and this again is from Stanislav. Sure. How will battery longevity as related to degradation impact cost analysis? For example, if you have 1,000 cycles versus 5,000 cycles versus 20,000 cycles. It will absolutely matter. Um, and again, here we have a little bit of a data limitation and a bit of a what we can realistically focus on limitation. Uh, the longevity of a battery, especially a lithium ion battery, is in part dependent on how it's used and the conditions in which it's used. And so it, it wasn't something that really lended itself to easy comparison between the early 1990s and early late 2010s. Uh, we could have come up with estimates, but that would have introduced a considerable amount more uncertainty into the analysis. But we, we did focus on really one metric, which was the cost per energy capacity. This approach and the data used for it could also be applied to looking at other metrics. For example, the cost per energy capacity multiplied by the number of cycles one gets, which you can think of like as the total energy throughput of your storage system over its lifetime. Other people have proposed using this metric. Um, I mentioned it in the, the top-down uh, research I described earlier, which was published earlier this year. I believe I mentioned that metric. Uh, it, it's just not something we could do in this cost change analysis. But I would be, you know, happy to talk further and if people have data or, you know, ideas of how to study that over time. I'd be happy to, you know, discuss. Well, okay, so you've handled the question. So we want to sure. thank you very much for a, for a wonderful discussion today. Thank you.